Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Thank you very much for coming to this IEA Liberal Vision uh, Fringe event. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs, which you see advertised on these boards in the room. Uh, I'm also a former head of media for the Liberal Democrats and pop up occasionally to give my views on the Liberal Democrats on the airways, much to the chagrin of large swathes of Liberal Democrat activists and certainly to the chagrin of most of them who seem to appear on Twitter. Uh, anyway, my job tonight is to facilitate a conversation, not to express my views, to chair a conversation. And we're delighted to be joining uh, with Liberal Vision to put on this event, Orange Bookers versus Social Democrats, what does the future hold for the Lib Dems? But I should start by saying there was a, there's a slight change to our published programme. I think if you looked us up in the conference guide, you might have been expecting David Laws, but we are delighted instead to have Jeremy Brown. At the time that David agreed, I think he was unaware that he was going to end up as a Minister of the Department of Education. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> uh, he claimed to be unaware. He wrote his name to <laughs> <laughs> uh, So that's just yet another perhaps small downside to, uh, to the party being in government. The Orange Book was published eight years ago in 2004 and provoked something of an internal party storm of controversy at the time. It contained some fairly bold proposals and suggested an approach of four-cornered liberalism. Since its publication, the book, some of its ideas, but certainly the title of the book, has been used as a rallying point uh, and a tag in the media. Um, for those in the party who seem to be in a sort of slightly more market oriented liberal direction than, um, than the official party policy has sometimes been. Uh, David Laws argues in a publication that we printed just uh, this June in our edition of Economic Affairs, eight years since the Orange Book, had the Liberal Democrats reclaimed liberalism, that possibly without the Orange Book, coalition with the Conservatives would have been impossible that uh, the Orange Book, book didn't bring about the coalition or circumstances that the coalition of Conservatives, but rendered such a coalition possible. And if you would like to read David's wise words, or indeed a range of other essays that we've included on looking back on the eight years since the Orange Book's publication, uh, this great publication is available not for £12.50, but for just £5 from Ruth Porter at the back of the room there, if you'd like to buy a copy afterwards. And that's the final <coughs> stop that we have left. So if you don't buy it today, you won't be able to get your hands in it. Uh, let me now introduce our panel. Um, I'll introduce them in the order that they're going to speak. From uh, on my uh, far right, Stanley Brown, MP, Home Office uh, Minister for uh, State, and the Liberal Democrat Member of Parliament for Taunton frequently described as being an orange booker. He'll be able to tell us in his own words whether or not he considers that uh, a reasonable description. On my immediate right is Evan Harris, um, who was the uh, Liberal Democrat Member of Parliament for Fox of Western Avenue for 13 years, and Liberal Democrat science spokesman, and now a regular commentator on matters Liberal Democrat and, and um, other ethical and liberal matters more generally. On my immediate left is Paul Marshall, who was co-editor of the Orange Book and is Chairman and Chief uh, Investment Officer of Marshall Waste. Um, Paul also chairs one of the largest chains of academies in the country, Bark, and has put on record several times his desire to see more market mechanisms and profit making in schools. And we will be joined shortly, I'm told, he's just uh, filing a copy for The Guardian at the moment by Nick Watt, the Chief Political Correspondent of The Guardian. Um, who will be joining us later to give his thoughts. Uh, Nick said uh, just over a month ago, Clegg clearly has a knack of infuriating both left and right. If, as he told me, he is seeking to capture what he described to me as small L liberal voters on the centre ground, that is not a bad piece of turf to occupy. I'm going to ask each of our speakers to speak for about seven minutes and I'll start packing things out here if you overrun too, too much. Uh, we will then hand over to you to ask questions, make comments and contributions, and we should get everything wrapped up by 7.30 sharp. So thank you for joining us, 
And please welcome our first speaker, Jeremy Brown. Jeremy. <laughs> Mark, thank you very much. Sorry I'm not um, David Laws, but I have the next door constituency and I, I think I probably do have a very uh, similar take on the party's positioning to David, so uh, I'm happy to be a surrogate for him. Um, I want to start, well, let me make a quick point. I think if people want oppositionist-minded social democracy, there is a danger that they might find it in an opposition social democrat party, i.e. Labour, to a greater extent than they'll find it in a governing liberal-minded party, i.e. Us. So there is a political consideration here, but I don't want to make a political speech to you today because I think you've come here to have a, an intellectual, if you like, an ideological discussion rather than a party positioning discussion. So let me tell you why I regard myself in shorthand terms as an orange book liberal, what I think that represents and why I think that is true to our party's instincts and our party's uh, interests. And I, I recommend by the way, I commend Paul and David for uh, publishing the book. And I recommend, if you don't read it all, read David's introductory chapter, because I think it might debunk a few of the myths that exist in the party, that to be an Orange Book Liberal is essentially to be a Tory. And I don't think it is. I think to be an Orange Book Liberal is to be a Liberal. And what do I mean by that? I mean somebody who attaches importance to personal freedom, the freedom to be who you are, and attaches importance to opportunity, the opportunity to be what you could be. And I think that is the liberal promise. And the question is, how do we deliver that in practice? And the book talked about four strands of liberalism, if you like, the sort of four corners of the table, and whether we had the weight loaded on those four corners in a way that truly represented liberalism. And just as a recap, talked about political liberalism, uh, the whole idea of power being vested in the individual and communities rather than in a more centralised and remote state. Talked about personal liberalism, your freedom from oppression by the state, but also your freedom from conformity imposed upon you by wider society. Talked about social liberalism. People think it didn't talk about socialism, but it did. Which is that the state does have a role, so let me debunk a myth, the state does have a role in promoting liberalism. Liberalism is not just about state minimalism. If you represent, for example, a largely rural constituency like mine, and you go back 100 or so, a bit more, 100 years, if you worked in agriculture and your father couldn't read or write, he wouldn't have the means to send you to a place where you could be taught to read and write. You would automatically go into working on the same farm in a labouring role. And everybody, I think, the liberal reformers are the people who recognised that the state can give people an opportunity to realise their full potential by, in that case I just cited, allowing people to be educated rather, even in the circumstances of them having parents who couldn't afford to pay for that education. And I even see this now in my new role as a Home Office Minister, that if you are, for example, a, an elderly widow uh, at home, terrified of going out after dark because you are fearful of the gangs of teenagers roaming around outside. The state is not a threat to your liberalism, your liberties in those circumstances. The state is your best prospect of salvation because the state is the means by which you may be freed from your self-imposed house arrest because of your fear of crime. So I recognise, and the book, the Orange Book, recognises that there is a social liberal leg of the table. And the final one was about economic liberalism, a belief in free markets and free trade. Now where are we as a party? I don't propose to talk about political liberalism because I think that is the most consensual area in the party and you will have seen the debate on House of Lords reform, for example, in the main conference chamber where it's almost unanimous belief in the merits of political liberalism. I personally think that we have a way to go in terms of personal liberalism. I think we can sometimes allow ourselves to believe in a concept which I don't think actually can be squared, which is a sort of sense of liberal paternalism. I just don't think that really stands up as an ideological proposition, and I think we can sometimes be in danger of a party of believing you should be free to do whatever you like as long as it basically conforms to what Lib Dems approve of, which isn't the same as personal freedom. And I personally don't think the state has a role in telling people how many fizzy drinks, for example, they should be allowed to consume, and I think it is strange that we as a party seem to regard that 
as a function of our role in politics. But I won't uh, talk about that area and then further. What I want to do is conclude my remarks by talking about where the tension, I think, lies, which is in this social liberalism and economic liberalism distribution within the party, the sort of balance between those two, the division, if you like, between the role of the state uh, and the role of the individual. And as I said, I think it is a caricature that the state has no role uh, in liberal uh, ambitions, if you like, and that there's a caricature of what the Orange Book Lib Dems have said. But I do have two propositions to put before you. One is that we should, as a party, as liberals, avoid excessive faith in the role of the state. And secondly, that we should put a premium on understanding that the individual is sovereign. The individual is the building block of liberalism, and the state is the servant of the individual, not the master of the individual. Let me expand on those two propositions. Firstly, that we should avoid excessive faith in the state. I acknowledge that the private sector is not always best. I think everybody who saw the Olympic security would recognize that the role of the army was almost certainly superior to the role of G4S. <laughs> Although, they're looking after us at our conference, so I should be there. <laughs> so I, I, I don't, I'm not arguing, again, it's a danger of caricature in the Orange Book, I'm not arguing that in all circumstances, private equals good, state public equals bad. But, I am arguing that I think the party can have excessive faith in the state, and I think on the whole, the private sector is more innovative, it is more reliable, it is more people centre orientated, if I can put it in those terms. Why is it all of those things? Why? Because of a Darwinian process of competition, which means that if the private sector doesn't respond to the demands of their customers, they no longer exist. I'll put it to you in these terms. If you're offered a free car, a BMW or Trabant, I think nearly all of you would vote with your feet and pick the BMW because BMW would not exist if they weren't able to provide a car which their customers would want to buy. And it is for that reason, it is for that reason <coughs> that the Liberal Democrats ought to be, and Liberals are, as suspicious of private monopolies as we are of state sector monopolies because our objection is to an unresponsive service provider who doesn't have to be accountable to the people who are using that service. And that is much less likely to be a danger in the private sector, although it can be in cartels and monopolistic practices, which is why we would like to be vigilant about those, than it can be in the state sector where you're nearly always, almost by definition, having a monopoly provider of a service. The second, uh, which was my point about the sovereignty of the individual, is I believe in two things. I believe in choice, and I think we should as a party believe in choice for the individual. In effect, I'll give you an example again. Schooling, education. We have, in my view, a sterile debate in this party. There is choice in education. There is choice if you have enough money to A, send your child to a private school, or B, move your house to the catchment of a good state school. For me, the debate in the party is between those who think that choice should only be for wealthy people, and those like me, the orange bookers, who believe that choice should be available for everybody, regardless of your wealth. In other words, about empowering individual citizens, and I dispute that the state should always be the provider of a service. Let me give you a, an example. I think in an advanced country, a reasonably affluent country like our own, nobody should have a safety net which doesn't enable them to eat properly fairly uncontroversial proposition. But I don't think the state should run supermarkets. Why? Because the state is bad at running supermarkets. And go to countries where the state have tried it, pretty much they've given <coughs> because that ideological debate has been won. In other words, the state is the guarantor of the, of the objective, but the deliverer of the objective can be the private sector. And I don't see any reason why that compromises liberalism. In fact, on the contrary, uh, I would uh, put to you that if you had a choice of going to a state sector supermarket or a private sector supermarket, in my example, uh, you would go to the private one because the level of service would be that much greater. So those are my 
uh, suggesting to you that orange book liberalism is about avoiding excessive faith in the state and it is about putting sovereignty power in the hands of the individual. And I think we need to make sure as a party that all four legs of that table are supporting the weight and that we remember those propositions. And I think we will end up with a balanced liberal offer, which is not just about splitting the difference between the Labour Party and the Conservatives. It infuriates me that Liberal Democrats believe in being equidistant between the other two. No, we don't. We're not reliant on what they believe in in order to work out where we stand. We believe in a distinct third progressive tradition in British politics, which is liberalism. And I think the Orange Book got closer than any other book has done in my political lifetime in explaining in balanced terms what that represents for our party. text or whatever, but if, you're mobile, if you have a mobile phone or another electronic device liable to make an irritating sound, I would be very grateful if you could switch it off or to silent. And secondly, I think being passed around the room is an IEA mailing list sheet, which you can sign up for. If you put down your email, we at the IEA will keep you uh, abreast of upcoming events about uh, free markets and free market themes. I promise not to spam you, you only get about one email a month. So if you'd like to sign up for that, please put your email address down on the sheet that's going around the room. Sorry for forgetting those earlier. Um, Evan Harris, um, as I said, MP for Fox West for 13 years, still a very regular, probably a more regular commentator on political and ethical affairs. Uh, to give his take, please welcome Evan. Thank you very much. I want to start exactly the same way as Jeremy in saying in these straightened times that I also regret I'm not David Laws, um, uh, but, um, but uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be at an IEA event and I'm grateful to Mark for inviting me. I actually welcome it actually when Mark is on the, on the TV putting the IEA view because it helps provide the differentiation that we need to do, we need to have between ourselves and the Conservative Party, I'm not saying that the Conservative Party, but he, he espoused on behalf of that organisation views that we as a party, democratically decided not to support. And since sometimes, although I'm pleased to say not so recently, uh, government ministers are too polite to argue with each other in public across the party, we need to have that debate by proxy. We cannot go to the next election, and I'm addressing here the title of, your, of, of this talk, what is the future? of the Liberal Democrats, we cannot go into the next general election having attacked one party appropriately for five years and another party for one month. It's just not a sustainable position for us as an independent party. It's not even about equidistance, which we need to have. It's about whether we are credible as an independent party. And so I look forward to, and I am enjoying the way, uh, not just because I disagree although I do, with a considerable amount of what Conservatives in government are saying, I think Jeremy would as well. But I, I welcome the fact that our Liberal Democrats in government, particularly in Nick, are now showing that differentiation. The only difference, I guess, between the Social <coughs> Liberal Forum position on that and that of the uh, people associated with the Orange Book is that we thought it should have started much earlier, you know, <coughs> with just a few months, not take two years to occur. Um, the, um, now, I also want to agree with Jeremy that there's not a huge amount that separates the Social Liberal Forum from uh, those members of the Social Liberal Forum from those people associated with the Orange Book. There, you know, there are a few policy areas and the existence of a benefactor. Okay, <laughs> and, 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 and I'm jealous of one of those. The Social Liberal Forum is jealous of one of those, but was ever thus the the uh, what's the right term? Um, the right uh, often has the resources, as we see in the popular press. Nevertheless, uh, after seeking sort of sympathy, I'll move on to something more substantial. Um, so the areas are not are not the areas of disagreement are not classical uh, with a small c uh, liberal areas. Uh, the uh, people associated with the Orange Book have at least as good a record, I would say, 
on individual liberty, including Jeremy Brown and David Laws, if you look at their voting record on these sorts of things, than some of the people who are associated uh, in, with the, the mainstream, the social liberal mainstream of the party. Okay? Because it's not something that it often depends on whether you have certain uh, sincere and, and, and condemn them uh, religious views, you're not going to be as liberal on certain issues, certain issues as others. It's not to do with whether you're you, you, where, where your position stands on the importance of social justice, which is a higher priority for the social liberals, or whether uh, on, um, on um, neo-economic liberalism, which it is uh, for, the, for the orange bookers. Um, and so that's why I always find the IEA uh, and, and Tories who claim, separate entities, Tories who claim that they are pro-individual liberty are so weak on fundamental issues of individual liberty, like the rights of people to have equal rights regardless of their sexual orientation, like the rights of people to, uh, the, the needs of people to have treatment for drug addiction without being criminalized, indeed arguably, as in respect of, of, of at least one legal drug, uh, tobacco, Mark is a, is a leading advocate of, that there should be, there should not be the state. And I tell you, the IEA, I go to their IEA lunches on individual liberty issues, and I say to them, you know, you're a great individual liberty, where are your drugs? Oh, we've got to criminalise more enforcement. So they are, well, I'm saying, it's more than total legalisation. I'm delighted to hear it. But the Conservatives, certainly, who describe themselves often as classical economic liberals, the Gladstone image, are not consistent. Okay, and what I'm saying to compliment is that the uh, Orange Book uh, economic liberals are liberal throughout. So where is the disagreement? I've already hinted that it's a question of where you put social justice. Okay, and I think that uh, you can, and I am, a social democrat within the liberal democrats. It's a merge of two parties. Uh, the social liberals are not all social democrats, but there is an important social democratic tradition in this party of Roy Jenkins, of Shirley Williams, uh, and people like that who recognize that you can't allow, to the same extent that others would, markets to run on travel, particularly in the delivery of essential public services, because the costs in terms of fairness are too high. Okay? And it's just a question of where you put that priority. Uh, and some people claim, well, of course, we care about it too. And Thatcher said this, but it'll trickle down, you know, and something will trickle down into the in, into the gutter. And and we know that that the evidence is that that doesn't happen. And if you look at societies, which are historically not socialist, not authoritarian labour, but social democratic, you get more fairness. And it is argued, and the evidence here is is not absolute, but where you get that greater equality, you get other social virtues as well. So where do I, where are the dividing lines? As I've said, they're only in a small area of our policy, um, and, and indeed we've just had a debate uh, where I don't think there was that division on, on assisted dying. I don't know how many of you were in that, in that debate where uh, I managed to win an argument more effectively by not speaking. <laughs> <laughs> well, despite not speaking, it's very worrying that people will, 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 uh, will take that as a, as a, uh, as a precedent. Um, so let's look at uh, supermarkets versus health services. Okay, what is the difference? Is it, why don't we operate provision of healthcare like a supermarket where the consumer chooses uh, their provision, just as they choose <coughs> their provisions in a supermarket? And I, I, I've had this debate with Jeremy before, and I simply don't accept that you can make the analogy between an informed consumer, okay, who knows what sort of bread, how they want their bread sliced you know, what, what colour they want their bread, you know, what, whether they want butter or something they, they can't believe is butter or, or margarine that they don't believe is margarine. <laughs> that is their, they, you know, they're clearly going to choose. That's not the way it works in healthcare because of the inequality, okay, between even an informed patient and uh, the, 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 the need for, for assistance that they require, okay. You're never going to, even with the most informed patients, which we want to see, the most informed consumers, the ability to negotiate the system, okay, without, given that there is a limited resources, damaging people who, through no fault of their own, are less able with the sharp elbows to negotiate the queues. 
So it can never be that sort of a market. Yes, you can have a variety of providers, but I think there is a, obviously, I believe, there's a role for the state to ensure that there is uh, funding available so that it's free at the point of delivery, okay, which of course it isn't. Anyone needs prescriptions, for example, it isn't free at the point of delivery at the moment. Uh, and that it's not just about uh, state-funded healthcare free at the point of delivery, but that some thought is given by people who commission care to issues of fairness. Because when you have a resource cap system, and we ought to be, politicians ought to be more honest about the rationing that occurs, more choice for someone else when there isn't capacity in the system means less for some, someone else in turn. And it's the same with, uh, and so, so it's not a question of having a variety of providers even, although there is a concern about a lack of love and playing field. It is about whether you have a state that, uh, that someone in the system thinks about equity, because the market doesn't think about equity, never does, okay? And, and we shouldn't expect it to. I'm not criticizing the market, uh, that it'll do what it does. Let's take schools. <laughs> Choice. Choice. Everyone knows, okay, that schools choose pupils. And parents exercise a preference. They do not choose. They can choose where to apply, but the schools choose. So if you provide more preferences available to middle class families in areas, when there isn't, when there's a shortage of resources and there isn't the capacity in the system, or you suck pupils who have the ability to be driven by daddy in, in Jeremy's BMW analogy <laughs> to that school, then you're going to have people who are left stranded in a failing school. You need to keep the aspirants in those schools, which is why the same argument that is used for these academies and free schools is used for grammar schools. Oh, more choice. Parents can choose between the grammar school and, because you should never mention grammar schools without mentioning the consequence, which is secondary models. There is, obviously, that's more choice. Two different types of school. A creaming off of the aspirant uh, and a sick school for those that are left without those uh, pupils who, you know, who could show the way to people from less um, favoured educational backgrounds. <coughs> so these glib terms of more choice are that. They're glib. They don't show the, the, the necessity of having an organised system so that there is fairness for those who are less able to make choices. I've only got 30 seconds left and I just wanted to um, question, uh, talk about the difference between a nanny state and a nurturing state. Okay? Because I campaign, I think it's well recognised, for more freedom of choice on, for example, drugs, on people not being banned from speaking their mind even when it's uh, uh, offends someone on religious grounds or other grounds. Um, but the difference between a nannying state and a nurturing state is that a nurturing state, which we should have, recognise that there are people who are vulnerable, okay? Where you need to have mechanisms, for example, if it works, okay, and only if it works, of increasing taxes on unhealthy choices in order to spend that money in making healthy food choices available for children, okay, who are vulnerable and aren't free agents in the market, in any market, uh, give them the ability to have more affordable access to better food because of the crisis that we already have and is developing in unhealthy eating and obesity. It's the same with, with smoking, okay? It's the, a nurturing state says that someone should not have to breathe in, in an enclosed public space or workplace, someone else's smoke. I don't think that's a nanny state. I think that's a nurturing protective state which is, which is demarcated where there is justification to protect the vulnerable. I don't think we should let markets rip in those the areas that I've mentioned, and I think that is the difference between social liberals who place social justice and equity rather higher than simply saying that we'll have the market and then the police and the army. It's not like that, and I think, although there's little between us, there are crucial differences that should inform our next manifesto and the way forward. I should just clarify a point about the Institute of Economic Affairs. Although we have no corporate position on any issue, we argue for liberalisation in virtually every area. Um, and um, so, although Evan might consider me a tobacco peddling conservative, um, <laughs> our, our recent books on our, our, our recent books on 
prohibitions, for example, has argued for a much more liberalised approach in pornography, prostitution, and currently illegal drugs than the Liberal Democrats are anywhere close to embracing, let alone the Conservatives. Uh, anyway, that's enough from your tobacco um, peddling Conservative. <laughs> On to our right wing benefactors. <laughs> 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 Please welcome, um, please welcome Paul Marshall, the co-editor. I knew, I've never been on a panel with Evan Harris before, but I knew, I anticipated that when I was, he'd find a very funny way of insulting me. <laughs> um, the, I will make one apology uh, on behalf of the Orange Book. The big mistake we made on the Orange Book uh, was the print run. We only printed 3,200 copies. The result of which is that it is a book which is much more comment upon, commented upon than read. And as, as Jeremy says, there is therefore a little bit of mythology about what the book actually said. And I just want to um, uh, state, uh, slightly restating what Jeremy said, but just summarize very briefly the argument <coughs> of the origin. It was not very original. Okay? It was simply reclaiming a tradition which we saw as having four pillars, uh, personal liberalism, political, social, and economic, uh, but which we believed was the strongest uh, uh, and uh, most powerful tradition in British politics, most resilient <coughs> tradition, much more powerful and more relevant to today's problems than socialism, and it needed to be restated. And it's the, it's the tradition of Cobden, of Bright, of Roundtree, without whose money this party would have long ceased to exist, uh, of uh, Asquith, of Churchill, who made the best defense of liberalism, in my view, ever in 1908 in his Dundee speech, in, in contrast to socialism, uh, of Lloyd George, and of Joe Grimm, and indeed of a lot of uh, succession of modern, modern leaders through to Paddy Ashton. Um, and that is not controversial, but there was a subtext which Jeremy and Evan have talked about a little bit, which is there was a subtext within the book which was controversial in 2004. And that was that we believed that the party was neglecting one of its four pillars, which was economic liberalism, and because we were neglecting it, it was in danger of making the party lose its balance, the table needs uh, four legs, and its relevance. And the, the, re the argument, uh, as both the previous speakers have said, Although it's around a narrow area, it's actually absolutely critical to the problems facing our country today, how you, how you, where you fall on, those, on, on the balance between economic and social liberalism. And I just want to summarize that argument in three areas, uh, three, three points. The first point is uh, what David Law said in his chapter uh, was about using economically liberal means to deliver, deliver social liberal ends. And Vince Cable addressed this, the same issue when he talked about pluralism of providers. That, of course, is code, or what's code for public service reform. And at the time, what I would call the social democratic wing of the party had its face set against any type of public sector, public service reform, uh, including, and in particular, the granting of freedom to schools to be independently managed. Uh, we set our face, and sadly, we. We, this was in a situation where the Labour Party was leading on public service reform, uh, and where the Tory party now has also, under Michael Gove, come forward very strongly on education in terms of liberalising the structure of school provision in this country. And despite what David and Vince wrote in the, in the Orange Book, we've, we've come along gradually, uh, but we are seen in the public eye to be consistently dragging our feet vis-a-vis -vis the other two parties. And effectively, we have been dragging our feet in, in the area of education, which is the one I'm particularly interested in, behind the other two parties, and therefore failing to get credit for reforms which are transforming the lives of disadvantaged children in this country. And the Evan Harris defense, which is that uh, we don't want uh, too many successful schools because then the parents would have the choice to, to send their children, to, well, we have a problem with choice, is effectively the John Prescott argument. Let's not have any academies because everybody will, will want to send their children there. What has happened is now there is very strong evidence that the, the first wave of academies have delivered very substantial improvements to the education of disadvantaged children. And sadly, we as a party have consistently lagged behind the debate. 
And that debate is still live today, and we as a party need to be on the front foot, uh, showing our commitment to social liberalism by delivering it in a way that is effective and, 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 and meaningful to the lives of our young children. Um, the second uh, area uh, of, which is highly contentious, uh, is, the, is Vince Cable's fiscal rule. Uh, in case uh, not everybody read the Orange Book, Vince Cable proposed in the Orange Book <coughs> to limit his cap on state spending of 40% of GDP. At the time, state spending was a little bit less uh, than 40%. GDP, but it had begun its the ascent uh, under the Labour Party <coughs> uh, with Gordon Brown uh, as Prime Minister. Um, and in Vince's words, uh, the advantage of a fiscal rule is, and I quote, attention is focused on two key issues, one being how to get greater value from the same level of public services, and two, how to define priorities. Hear, hear. Today, as we know, fiscal spend, uh, government spending is 46% of GDP. Unfortunately, the rate of tax collection is 38% of GDP. The gap, uh, Evan, is 8%. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, as a country, we are living well beyond our means. So one of the great political questions today is, and probably the biggest question today, actually, is how do we close that gap? Uh, it's clearly pretty clear to me, and this I'm sure not everybody's agreement in the room, that we have reached the limits of how much tax the state can raise. It's been in the high 30s for most of the last 10 years. It has not got above that figure. And you saw with the last budget what happened when the government tried to find ways of, of raising extra tax. Uh, there are, of course, those that argue that you should get the rich, the rich to pay more tax. Uh, more tax, that is, than the 50% of tax that the top 10% of income tax payers already pay. Uh, but this is really not uh, a substantial argument in terms of the dilemma facing the country. It's good, it's low politics essentially. If you have a wealth tax, which actually I'm in favor of vis-a-vis -vis income tax, but if you have a wealth tax, this time we're talking about, it might raise four, five billion pounds. That's 0.2% of GDP. It does not get close to dealing with the problem of our deficit. So um, this is a major, major issue for the party and for the country. And personally, I'm strongly in favour of the in favour of uh, the more right-wing approach of Vince Cable, which is to essentially recognise that that, uh, uh, that states that, that, that there has to be a cap, and it's a lot lower. Well, I'm not actually in favour of a cap, but the, the the natural level of what the country should be willing to live with is much lower than where it is today, and that's that's where we have to close the deficit. Third and final point. Um, about the Orange Book was that it, what it represented in some respects was the determination by a talented group of MPs for the Liberal Democrats to enter government for the first time in 70 years. And because they believed that, they wanted us as a party and as a country to face the challenges and the constraints of government. And in that sense, rather than being economically liberal, they were being economically literate. Uh, it was a statement that we had to be real, <coughs> get real about the challenge of facing government. You have to remember that the Orange Book was written in 2004. I just want to remind you of the program that we, the Liberal Democrats, went into the, into, into the elections with in 2005, the, 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 ten, the 10 pledges. Increase the top rate of tax to 50p, add 21,000 extra teachers, 10,000 more police officers, 20,000 more community support officers, lower class sizes, very little evidence that impacts children's outcomes, uh, plus the inevitable well-targeted bribes, scrap tuition fees, free personal care, an extra £100 per month for all pensions over £75, uh, over 75, and free eye and dental checks. <laughs> there was absolutely no philosophical spine running through our program and no attempt to grapple with the real issues facing our country, such as public service and welfare reform. It was, in essence, a combination of intellectual vacuity and Tammany Hall by-election techniques, which had been very successful under Chris Reynolds' leadership of the, of the, of the more management of the electoral side of the party. We would never have been able to enter any type of coalition negotiations, either with the Labour Party or with the Conservative Party, 
in 2005 as it being a home parliament. Uh, instead, in 2010, we were able to negotiate with both parties on the basis of four key priorities that we set out in the manifesto, which effectively combined in a balanced way social and economic liberalism. These were fair taxes, to put money back in people's pockets, which was a tax cutting agenda for people on low and middle incomes, a fair chance for every child, uh, which was primarily about the pupil premium, creating jobs by making Britain greener, which is pro-environment, and constitutional reform. That was the, those are the four points of the programme. We've done a not a comprehensive job of getting that implemented, but a good job of making that real in our country's governments. And the fact we were able to do that was because of the leadership of Nick Clegg, of Danny Alexander, who wrote the manifesto, and of David Laws, who was presided at much of the policy ballast. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we had one lapse of discipline, one concession to the oppositionitis which had plagued us in 2004, and that was signing the pledge on tuition fees, which we now know that neither Vince nor Nick nor Danny really believed at the time, but they did it because they thought it brought, brought electoral advantage. This was a moment of weakness, which has come back to haunt the party, and deservedly so. To the extent the Orange Book marks the end of oppositionitis, we must all be Orange Bookers. I, for one, am not interested in another 50 years of opposition or 50 years of irrelevance. I'm not interested in making policy which ignores the economic constraints the country faces. I'm not interested uh, which, in making policy which ignores the importance of wealth creation. I'm not interested in politics which treats the state as one giant Tammany Hall. Those days are over. I want to be in government. I want all of us to be in government. Well, I want Jeremy to be in government. But I want to be in government. Uh, but, uh, in, but to change the country for the better, to reform education, to take low earners out of tax, to reform the banking system, and to create a fairer society. Thank you. So, Nick, can I make the floor yours for a few quick comments? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. And uh, I'm really sorry I'm late. Um, I was having to file um, stories. One of them was what Vince Cable was going to say tomorrow, so that involves sort of having to get my brain around some quite techy things. Uh, the other one was to file uh, on the Andrew Mitchell story, which was uh, slightly less techy, but exactly what he meant when he used the word that obviously we don't utter in this hall, because this is a happy, polite family uh, event. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk at great length, because you've uh, heard from everyone here, and I'll probably repeat what they've said, uh, and anyway, you probably want to question us. So I will just very briefly say, obviously, as part of my preparations for this, I uh, pulled this down from the bookshelf uh, and did uh, um, some swatting. And, and the first thing I'd say is I'm quite surprised Mark, you know, as head of a very august body like the Institute, the IEA, has, has fallen into the trap that we journalists are always accused of falling into, which is coming up with cheap and easy labels. And the cheap and easy label is that you could say on the one hand there are the orange bookers and on the other there are the sort of the lefties from the SDP. And obviously, as the panel have been saying, um, two of the people referred to, I think, by the Clegg crowd as the continuity SDP, that's the latest insult. <laughs> that's Vince Cable and Chris Hume. Well, they've got essays in here. Essays in here, I think, in the case of Chris, about how you fashion a new form of global economic governance in a liberal way. And uh, Vince Cable, you've probably been talking about the piece that he wrote in this book, which is essentially talking about how you uh, marry social...